Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this one of the first sessions of Privacy Camp. I think we are all kind of excited to kick off this uh, morning, so bear with us if we are a bit nervous um, as we start. So as the name of, the of this session states, uh, we are going to talk about the rise and rise of border technology in um, European legislation and the intersection between digital files and migration files. So what we will do today will be to um, reflect on how um, digital files are um, legalized, you digital files are legalizing in a way um, the digitalization of migration procedures, but also normalizing uh, some practices um, that have been proven to be um, high, violent and highly discriminatory against um, people without a regular migration status, um, people applying for asylum, refugees, and more general uh, people crossing borders. Um, so we will um, also reflect on the role of um, digital policy in uh, reinforcing um, the nar security narrative that it's um, um, spreading around borders and migration in general, and um, also this idea that non-European citizens represent a threat to European countries and that therefore should be pushed back uh, and pushed outside of the European borders with any means, including um, digital ones. So as the title of this panel suggests, um, we will kick off this discussion through the eyes of the Artificial Intelligence Act, which is um, regulation proposed by the European Commission, um, April 2021. Um, and the objective of this regulation is to promote the uptake of trustworthy AI while at the same time protecting fundamental rights. But in our work as civil society, we have been asking ourselves one fundamental question, which is what rights are we talking about? In fact, um, despite the evidence of uh, the deployment of many AI, artificial intelligence-based systems in migration, such as um, the automation of migration procedures, uh, the use of biometric identification tools, or um, surveillance technology like um, drones to scan the borders, the proposed regulation is failing to capture all of these different types of technologies and to regulate them, um, despite uh, civil society um, recommendations and evidence of the use and abuse of um, artificial intelligence. So without further ado, um, I will start by presenting this amazing um, panel um, and speakers um, and friends also. So I'll uh, start with the civil society corner. Um, on my left, we have Alina Smith, who's uh, deputy director of PICUM, the platform of international cooperation on documented migrants, which is a Brussels-based uh, membership organization representing more than 160 um, organizations advocating for the rights of people without a um, regular migration status. Um, and Alina is also the focal point for um, the digital files at PICOM. Then we have uh, Hope Barker, uh, who's senior policy analyst at the Border Violence Monitoring Net Network, which is an horizontal um, collective uh, working on mainly on the region of the Western Balkans and is um, monitoring as you can see, and hope uh, we'll explain a bit more about this later, is monitoring the uh, practice of pushbacks um, in, in the region and the, uh, is collecting evidence about um, the violence against people crossing border. Um, and is the, as a collective now, they are starting to uh, monitor more and more the role of surveillance technology in, um, in facilitating pushbacks. Then on my right, um, we have Professor Nia Vivavola, um, Senior Lecturer and Associate Professor at Queen Mary University. Nia is one of the greatest experts when it comes to the digitalization of migration procedures. Uh, she has been started analyzing um, the expansion of migration databases when nobody was actually looking at them and also um, yeah, uh, saying how, denouncing the fundamental rights uh, implication that comes with the expansion of these databases. And then last but not least for sure, we have Simona De Her, which is digital um, advisor for the Green Link since uh, 2020. Um, Simona advises um, members of the European Parliament in uh, the Greens group, especially she's advisor to the MEP Tineke Strick and uh, Kim van Spanetak, who's um, one of the shadows of the AI Act, and she works on different files, the AI Act, but also platform, platform regulation and also the use of 
technology in migration procedure. So I can say that we have some good experts uh, today to um, talk about the rise and rise of um, border tech in EU legislations. But we will start through the AI Act eyes. So I will turn to Simona, since you uh, work with policymakers and you are involved in the policy making process. I think not everyone in the audience is aware of like where we are with the AI Act. No, maybe many of us are following this crazy regulation, but not everyone. So if you could give us a little uh, update of where we are at, and especially um, where we are at in this regulation with the uses of AI in the migration and border uh, management. Thank you. Do you have a... I think I just put my mic away. <laughs> Does this work? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Katarina. And um, maybe to zoom out a little bit, um, when we're speaking about the role of civil society today, you already mentioned I work on various files and technology in migration and at the border is seriously the most obscure and untransparent area I work on, which uh, makes us completely reliant on civil society, academics, investigative journalists to delve into these topics. So I'd like to start with a big thank you already in advance for helping us uh, doing all the work we do on this. And um, yes, well, if we zoom out um, broader policy-wise, we see that technology is used to facilitate and justify um, keeping people out and pushing people back at the moment. Um, when people do enter the territory, profiling, analyzing them, and um, tracking them constantly. And even in reception areas, we see surveillance systems that are really unprecedented are deployed. So, um, well, I find it really horrific to see sometimes what um, reports there are from the ground on what is happening. And I think it's very important to say that the paradox is that while on the one hand you can see the commission is championing these technologies and uh, member states too, we at the same time see that they're as secretive as possible about it. So this is also where it touches upon the AI Act. Uh, I've been told to keep it very simple and not to go off in an AI Act rant, so stop me if I do. For those uh, who haven't uh, been introduced to this law yet, the AI Act is uh, the Europe's attempt to regulate AI. You might think, wow, that's pretty broad. It is, and it's taking us a long time. <laughs> but um, the basic concept is, you basically look whether a system is high risk and poses a high risk to fundamental rights, and if it's up to the European Parliament, also to democracy, the rule of law, uh, or health and safety. And if it can be used for a certain use that has been shown to pose a risk to fundamental rights, for example, then you meet, need to meet a whole list of technical requirements. So make sure your system is not biased, make sure it's robust, make sure uh, it's cyber secure, et cetera. And um, there are also some transparency obligations that we're working on, and there is also a very important article with banned uses of artificial intelligence. Now, I think most important is uh, in the work of civil society here is that you've been pushing for uh, bans on certain uses. For example, risk profiling. Um, we've seen risk profiling go wrong in many areas. One of the ones that some of you will have heard me talk about a lot is the Dutch Child Benefits Affair, where the government uh, risk profiled uh, lots and lots of people and plummeted more than 70,000 people into debt, even losing their children, um, just because they had a quite relatively simple risk profiling system telling who was a fraud um, in child benefits and who was not. And we're seeing these exact same systems being deployed in the area of migration. We see, as Njovi will probably say, tell us a lot more about, huge databases being set up and linked together, uh, which another point in the AI Act were exempted completely from the AI Act because, yeah, all these very big databases, why would they have to meet basic requirements? Um, and I think the points on migration are going to be huge fights also with the member states because the member states have already finished their um, position 
And what we see they've done is they've exempted migration from all the transparency obligations from different areas, because that's what they like to do. They like to uh, use it as a solution for everything, but then be very secretive about it. So there can't be any public scrutiny, and that's an easy getaway for them. So these are uh, very important points we're negotiating about at the moment. The European Parliament is still negotiating among themselves before we go and negotiate with the member states. And um, we're still to discuss the bans in a couple of weeks, but we've definitely tabled a couple of bans on risk profiling in migration. Um, for example, lie detectors and emotion recognition in migration that we've seen have been tested and used on, um, well, refugees. Um, and these are things we've tabled. And at the same time, we see that the European Commission has designated some uses of um, AI and migration as high risk, but it, that also means you legitimize them. For example, they've said, well, okay, then we'll make polygraphs and emotion recognition used in migration, high risk, and then you'll have to meet a certain amounts of requirements when you use them. But this means that actually they're saying, well, if you meet a number of requirements, then it's okay to use these systems in migration. And I think these are developments that, well, as we'll discuss later, we see in lots of legislation that they're in law legitimizing the use of these horrific and dehumanizing systems, especially in the area of migration. And these are developments we need to stop as soon as possible, according to us. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks, Sima. You did a great uh, job in trying to summarize in um, yeah, five minutes this um, history of the AI Act, which is really complicated. For those of you who have been following from the beginning, it's kind of a soap opera up and downs. And, and I think, the, um, as you were mentioning, the migration demands show how um, contradictory can this uh, regulation can be um, because it applies certain safeguards to some systems but so, some others it actually fails to do so. So you mentioned that one of the most crucial articles and part of this regulation is concerns prohibitions. Therefore, this is a kind of like a courageous ste step of this regulation to say there are some systems that will uh, inevitably harm uh, fundamental rights. There are no mitigation measures that you can apply. Therefore, they should be banned. Um, however, we don't see any kind of uh, ban that applies to the context of migration, despite the mounting evidence of the irreversible harms that certain systems can, can lead to. So now I would like to ask Niovi if you could um, guide us through one of uh, civil society recommendations that, as Simona was saying, is about uh, prohibited, um, prohibiting um, risk assessment, automated risk assessment and profiling systems used in the migration procedures. So could you explain us what these systems are and why they should be prohibited? Thanks. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Katerina, for the kind invitation and introduction. And uh, it's also a great pleasure to see so many people interested in technology and migration. When I started my work 10 years ago, there were hardly any people interested or understanding what we were doing, and it was considered too technical. So now it's become quite mainstream and quite important, so it's so nice to, to, to see people interested in this field. Um, I, I want to start my contribution by making two vital points which relate particularly with the use of technology in migration context. And uh, we need to have in mind when we're looking into immigration law in particular, how immigration rules are inherently discriminating groups of individuals compared to citizens. They create uh, a divide between citizens and foreigners by default on the basis of the sovereign right of every state to decide with whom they wish to associate. And this also creates another, a, a huge imbalance of power between foreigners and the state. And that imbalance is also perpetuated by the fact that individuals are outside the border having more limited uh, access to remedies to lawyers, to legal aid. So with this 
um, uh, preliminary thoughts in mind, uh, we should approach the A Act and its migration-related provisions. So, uh, if one has a look at the AI Act, they will realize that there are only very limited, prohibited AI systems. Those related to social scoring and remote biometric identification uh, for um, uh, criminal law purposes. Uh, Everything else is fair game. And especially in relation to migration, there is nothing prohibited, notwithstanding many different uses of AI, and they are inherently discriminatory effects. Uh, I want to speak about four of these and guide you through as to why civil society and legal scholarship has uh, explained why they should be prohibited, at least for some years if not forever. The first one, and I think that's the, the for me, the, the biggest stake is emotional recognition and behavior analytics. Emotional recognition uh, looks basically as technology that takes uh, into account the facial exp expressions of an individual, the way that they speak, through lie detectors and other types of polygraphs, and they can uh, be used in order to um, enable a border guard or a person determining an asylum claim, whether that person tells the truth about their story. So they, it can help, can help, it can assist, uh, or it can doom an asylum seeker when they make a claim uh, and it uh, can be used for the credibility assessment. Or uh, and this technology should be banned for the very important reason that the, uh, it, the scientists show that it is not reliable. It cannot capture, uh, it may capture some basic moods uh, of individuals, but it cannot capture blended moods. It cannot capture different cultural um, uh, backgrounds. And for that, emotional recognition uh, is uh, vital to be prohibited at least until a lot of data are trained in order to make it uh, reliable, which cannot happen. Uh, uh, even people from, you know, the same country of origin, the same region, they may have, you know, different backgrounds, they may have very different expressions. And because of the impact that it can have in an asylum seeker's claim, uh, it, it is very vital to make it uh, prohibited at least uh, for many years. The second is predictive analytics. Predictive analytics is basically artificial intelligence technology that takes into account social media reports, satellites, radars, different types of information in order to predict migration flows. Uh, it is already tested uh, in uh, different uh, EU projects, uh, not with too much success, I have to say. And the problem with this technology is that it is a double-edged sword. It can be used either to welcome, to prepare a country to receive asylum seekers and other kinds of migrants, or it can be used to interdict and be used for unlawful pushbacks. And the problem is that we don't really know what is going to happen. And for that reason, predictive analytics, which miraculously doesn't even feature in the AI Act as an artificial intelligence system, should be banned because it can be abused by states. The third one, and uh, the, here we enter the arena of AI systems that are already being created at EU level, so it makes all the more difficult to ask for their prohibition because they are legitimized by the EU legislature in other files, are um, uh, automated risk assessments prof and profiling. So we are talking about systems that essentially are trained to find on the basis of huge amounts of statistics patterns or correlations in order to identify for future applications for visas of residence permits or of asylum seekers as to whether they pose a risk. It may be a security risk, it may be an irregular migration risk, but they are making automated risk assessment on the basis, if not of protected characteristics, at least of proxies of protected characteristics. So instead of using racial origin as an indicator, they may use the address, which may show racial origin. So this is a proxy. Um, so they are trained on the basis of data, which are provided by states, and those data are based on previous, previous decisions. Previous decisions in migration context can be very much discriminatory themselves. Border guards 
or you know, visa authorities are maybe discriminating uh, because they are not well trained, they, or they have inherent discrim biases. And those biases translate in algorithms, which means that here we institutionalize discriminatory treatment, even if it's not direct, indirect discriminatory treatment of different groups of migrants. Why this is a problem and why this technology should be prohibited, not only because, because this discriminatory treatment, in, it's indirect, and indirect discrimination at the moment is not well protected. There is not much uh, guarantees in the case law at the European at least level, which protects not only migrants, anyone from indirect discrimination. So unless we reconceive what is protected, what is the concept, the meaning, and the scope of the principle of non-discrimination, these technologies should be prohibited. The final one, and I know I'm speaking quite a lot, um, is remote biometric identification. So at the moment, it's only prohibited for criminal law uh, operations in criminal law context, uh, but again, member states want to downgrade that. Uh, and there is nothing on migration, which means that it, it, it's quite dystopian to think about it, is that they are going to be using cameras that are going to be seeing the faces of people coming at the border and again, and they can be abused in order to prevent people from sinking entry. And we're talking about not only migrants, but also refugees. So this can be a form of digital refoulement. Uh, and in this remote biometric identification, it involves obviously facial recognition. So these kind of technologies, again, are not fully reliable. It is a bit more reliable than emotional recognition, but still it's not reliable uh, as much. I think I'm going to stop uh, my contribution here. I, uh, this is food for thought for future discussions, and I look forward to those. Yeah, thank you. It's a full banquet of uh, food of, of, of thought. Um, you did a great job. Thank you very much in giving us an overview on the old uh, civil society recommendation on prohibitions, but also starting from the very uh, important uh, point, which is um, when it comes to migration policies, procedures, there is an imbalance of power that is inherent into the policy itself uh, that must be questioned in the moment that we um, analyze or advocate or influence uh, the policy. Because as you have um, have uh, explained, um, this, kind of, this imbalance can be then reproduced and reinforced in these systems that should be banned. Turning um, to Alina, um, another category, as Simona was explaining, of AI systems that are regulated in the AI Act is the high risk type of system, therefore risk systems that might um, lead to the infringement of fundamental rights. Uh, that in principle are not bad, but they could, um, they could lead to very negative eff effects on, on people's rights. Um, in the original proposal, uh, we have the Commission propose some AI, um, AI systems using migration that should be considered as high risk. However, uh, we see that there are like some very mis important missing points in the way that the Commission um, Look, captured all the AI systems that are already deployed uh, in migration. And one of the systems which is uh, missing is um, biometric identification tools. Um, so could you please tell us what these systems are and why are made, they are dangerous, where they are used, and what is their impact on the rights of undocumented people? Thank you very much, Katerina. Uh, really nice to be with you all this morning. Um, and just echoing Yovi's point, great to see the interest in these issues. Um, so, I mean, as a starting point, I think we all know ID checks are a central feature of migration policy. They happen routinely at borders, in airports, we've all experienced them, and on the streets of our neighborhoods. Um, and they're part of a strategy, essentially, to try to address um, concerns, uh, disproportionate concerns arguably about the use of false documents, and also to uh, achieve the European Union's goals around increasing the number of deportations. And artificial intelligence tools are widely used to facilitate identity checks. 
um, including through the use of mobile biometric identification devices that make it possible, for instance, to scan, to scan somebody's fingerprints or their face in the street, uh, instantaneously have information about them because that data is cross-checked against other databases. Um, so why does this matter? Why is this concerning? Um, so maybe it's just helpful, you know, as we've already done a little bit, to just step back and really contemplate a bit the context we're, we're speaking of. Um, so, you know, we can think, as we should, that immigration law really concerns administrative matters, right? It concerns who qualifies for visas and permits to enter a country, to remain in a country, to work, to study. All of this concerns administrative law, except that in reality, um, a significant portion of how immigration law functions borrows from the tools and even the logic of criminal law, and also from the very institutions of criminal law, like law enforcement. And so this comes, of course, without the corresponding rights and safeguards that we find in the criminal justice system. Um, and we know, um, and there is obviously very strong evidence of the fact that racial profiling is embedded in law enforcement practice. It's also embedded in immigration enforcement practice. Um, and indeed, um, the fact that how a person looks, including um, their skin color, their perceived ethnicity, um, are used as proxies for uh, whether they have authorization to be on the territory. And so I think it's important to underscore this has implications for lots of people. So the notion of who is deportable or who is potentially uh, subject to immigration control affects anyone who is viewed as potentially within those categories based on their appearance. And indeed, um, a survey from 2014 from the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights found that uh, 80 close to 80% of border guards surveyed um, found uh, that in airports, ethnicity was a quote-unquote helpful indicator of identifying people attempting to enter irregularly. Um, and the Dutch border police um, were supported in their use of racial profiling in airports by the Hague District Court in 2021, which agreed that indeed ethnicity can be a quote, important indication of nationality. Um, they then did away with this practice because of the public outcry about, obviously, pursuing this practice. Um, and so what is actually occurring in reality? Um, so State Watch produced a report, um, I think it was last year, um, on building the biometric state, which gives us a picture and a flavor of how already a number of member states have um, empowered law enforcement to do immigration control using handheld bi uh, biometric identification tools, including France, Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, Denmark, and Sweden, among others. Um, we know that since 2019, there's the smart policing program in Greece, um, which equips police with such devices to allow them to scan vehicle license plates, collect fingerprints, scan faces for the purposes of immigration control. Um, and some work done by NGOs in the UK found that the use of um, mobile handheld data for ID checks for immigration control between 2019 and 2020 resulted in systematic racial bias. So I think this is a really important part of the context that we're speaking of. And the concern that the use of these tools is um, very likely to exacerbate and to worsen existing practices. And I think it's also important to underscore that these tools go hand, the existence and use of these tools goes hand in glove with the drive to collect data about the people we're speaking about. Because these tools are used to cross check against various types of databases where personal biometric data are already existing or are being further gathered. So again, it kind of is a self-fulfilling or a vicious circle where we have the amassed data, therefore we use it to do this type of processing. Well, to do this type of processing, we need to have this amassed data to be able to cross-check and do the processing the way we, we, we wish to. So I think maybe just to briefly say something about, I think Simona already alluded to these vast migration IT systems that come under the, the framework of the EU's interoperability system um, so we're speaking about colossal levels of data collection oriented and targeted toward whom? 
toward non-EU citizens with a capacity of up to 300 million records to address uh, serious crimes like terrorism and irregular migration, as if these two things were coextensive. So already we see the baked in discrimination and false assumptions justifying the creation of these systems. And why are these systems created more practically was to support in part increased ID checks to identify people on the territory and potentially entering the territory who could become undocumented or irregular um, and deportable. And how to achieve that, but to, to equip those on the ground at borders and within our neighborhoods with the devices to allow them to do that on the spot. And so I think it's important again to re realize what the implications are, the consequences are for all different kinds of people entering Europe, but already in Europe, including people who are nationals, who are citizens, but who may be perceived as being foreigners. And what it means in terms of the likelihood of their interaction with law enforcement and the potential outcomes for them as individuals. And maybe just a final point that, again, when we think about, I think it's really important to underscore, um, and we're hearing about, and we'll hear a little bit more about later, EU, um, and to an extent also national level, legislation that normalizes and facilitates the use of technology in these ways. But let's be clear that the existing protections under the Charter and the GDPR apply to everyone regardless of their citizenship or immigration status. And what we see is the use of a the criminal justice mindset and a securitization objective without sufficient justification to make the case or not to make the case and just circumvent those protections. So to just go around them because we're to take for granted that this is about criminal law, this is about safety, and not to query whether that really, really is the case. So um, I think I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, I think the context really matters here in terms of understanding how these tools can worsen an existing reality and the particular impact it can have on um, the experience of individuals and their outcomes. Thank you, Alina. Um, you did a great job um, in yeah, setting the scenes, explaining what these systems are, um, what is the relationship with deportation, which is clearly one of the main objectives uh, of uh, the European Commission and, and agencies when it comes to uh, migration policies. And it's quite striking um, as you, if you compare like what Alina just talked about and the fact that um, policymakers negotiating the AI Act um, are really reluctant uh, to the idea of um, regulating uh, biometric identification systems in the AI Act and are um, attempting to exclude EU migration databases which are the source for making this uh, kind of tools um, working. And the other um, concerning missing piece in the uh, regulation is all those type of uh, surveillance technologies which are um, deployed um, at the EU borders and within the EU borders, uh, which have the objective to um, basically prevent entries um, and, um, and push people back uh, as this um, black pile of papers um, can test the testimony. So Hope, um, could you please um, Tell us first of all a bit about the work of Border Violence Monitoring Network and how you have uh, been observing the rise of surveillance technology um, within borders in the Western Balkans and what effects they have on people that are trying to cross borders. Yeah, thank you, Katerina. Um, yeah, so I will again come back to bringing uh, how these policies are playing out on the ground um, and how they're affecting people on the move currently. Um, so to do that, I'll have to explain a bit about who we are and how we work. Um, so the Border Violence Monitoring Network is a horizontal self-organized network that's denouncing pushbacks and other human rights violations um, against people on the move at and within European borders. So we're 14 member organizations active since 2017, stretching from Greece all the way up to Austria and Turkey, covering the whole Western Balkan route. Um, and basically what we, our field volunteers do is they contribute to a shared online database, which brings together first-hand accounts of pushbacks, um, which are 
illegal border cross, illegal cross border expulsions without due process, individualized assessment, or any opportunity for appealing those decisions made. So they're completely occurring outside of EU legislation and are illegal. Um, so the testimonies that are gathered by reporters in the field, um, these are done using a standardized reporting methodology. Um, and those testimonies then come together in our biggest publication that we do, which is the Black Book of Pushbacks, which is here, which people can take a look at when they want to later. Um, but basically, we bring together all of the evidence, all of the testimonies that we have with an accompanying analysis of trends and patterns in different countries, but also new emerging developments. And this is the new version of the book, which is over 3,000 pages. Um, and that's all of the testimonies we've collected since 2017. And in this version of the book, which we didn't have in the 2021, we have a new chapter on the use of new technology and artificial intelligence. So this is something that we've seen um, as a new rapidly expanding area of migration management. Um, we've seen artificial intelligence being advertised as a sort of technical panacea for the ongoing consequences of failed migration policy since the 2015 crisis, the so-called 2015 crisis. Um, and the, the real world implications of these new tools have been widely documented for years, including, as many people here have spoken about, the inherent bias and racism of algorithmic machine learning and the problematic consequences of risk-based or predictive policing. Um, but it is important to point out that artificial intelligence is not in and of itself the problem here, because some of these new technologies might have positive impacts, like using drones to identify people on the move in situations of risk and to organize search and rescue operations, just like the Sea Watch drone does along the central Mediterranean route. So the problem is not with the technology, but with how it's being used. And our data shows that how it's being used is to contribute to the facilitation of pushback practices and to enhance the ease with which they can be carried out. So we see devices like drones, thermal imaging cameras, vehicle scanners being weaponized against people on the move, making them easier to detect and therefore compounding their vulnerability and the dangers that they face. But on top of this, there's a concurrent trend of suppression and destruction of the technology owned by people on the move by state forces. So when transit groups are apprehended, they're normally stripped of their belongings, including their cell phones and power banks. And these are things that can be used not only to navigate the route, but to document the human rights violations that are being perpetrated against them. So the theft and destruction of mobile phones has been consistently documented in between 50 and 75% of our testimonies each year since 2017. But what we're seeing recently in, for example, Lighthouse Reports investigations is people on the move filming the violations that are being enacted against them to prove that these violations are occurring. So not only is technology being used against them, but the technology that they might use to empower themselves to record violations is being stripped of them. So we have these two concurrent trends happening. But then we also have uh, new technologies that are being weaponized to facilitate border violence and illegal pushbacks. So across our database, we see a range of different types of surveillance equipment being used. And we also see uh, biometric uh, information being gathered from people on the move. So we have widespread collection of the personal data of persons prior to their pushbacks, often when they're held in detention. So people's fingerprints are being taken, photographs of them, their countries of origin are being asked, they're being forced to sign papers. So in our database, respondents were forced to sign papers in 17% of all testimonies. Normally those are untranslated. They were photographed in 24% of all testimonies and had their fingerprints taken in 15% of all testimonies. And on top of this, various testimonies point to a breach of EU data protection regulation by Frontex officers specifically. We have a number of testimonies where respondents claim that Frontex officers or officers that they identified as Frontex took visual footage of them during apprehension, often on their personal phones. And these forms of data collection are virtually never accompanied with clear and informed consent, translation about the procedures that are happening, nor with, uh, nor with any information about the purpose of the collection or how it will be processed, 
None of this is articulated to the people who these procedures are being applied to. And these are all violations under current EU legislation around the collection of biometric data. But an even more violent usage of technology in pushbacks comes in the form of drones and thermal imaging cameras, either standalone or attached to surveillance vehicles. So since 2018, we have collected 36 testimonies where respondents mentioned drones prior to an apprehension that then results in a pushback. And that affects approximately over 1,000 people because all of our testimonies are group testimonies. So each one refers to a wider transit group. So there are drones that are being flown in border areas, often accompanied with thermal imaging sensors, to detect groups to then go and find them and illegally push them back. So obviously this is how technology is being used against and weaponized against people on the move. On top of this, drones are collecting vast amounts of data and the way they operate makes it virtually impossible for individuals to be aware that they're even being surveilled, which obviously raises ethical concerns as well as potential human rights, human rights infringe, infringements around freedom from discrimination, the right to privacy, data protection issues, and impacts on civil liberties and human dignity. But this is not just happening in one border area or just a few border areas. We've recorded these kinds of technologies used to detect and push back people on the move in Croatia, Greece, North Macedonia, Hungary, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Romania. So this is happening across the region and across the route. So this again brings us back to the point that New technologies are not inherently bad. These drones and thermal imaging cameras, like I said before, might be used to detect people at risk and organize search and rescue operations, but they're not being used for this. And I'll just quickly come back to the AI Act on that because one of the huge issues that we are seeing is that all of the obligations are being placed on developers and creators of the AI systems, and there's virtually no obligations on users. So the issue is that the, it's the usage of things like drones that are being weaponized against people on the move, not the drones themselves. So this gap in accountability for users is also a massively problematic issue. And I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Hope. Um, yeah, you gave a um, great and terrifying overview of what's um, happening on the region of the Western Balkans, the, the so-called Balkan route, um, the important work of Border Violence Monitoring Network. And um, so thank you uh, for being here and sharing with all of us um, your work. And also thank you for pointing out this very, very important uh, aspect uh, of the regulation of AI-based systems, which is the context of use, and which is critical when we are advocating for an inclusive um, high-risk uh, list of systems, uh, because as you pointed out, it's, it's not about the technology per se, but the use and the example that you, that you gave about drones, it's, 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 it's instrumental. We have Sea-Watch um, conducting search and rescue um, operation with the use of drones, but we have Frontex uh, using drones to uh, um, indicate the position of vessels to the Libyan Coast Guard and facilitating a uh, pullback towards the Libyan shores. Um, so, and I invite everyone later just to uh, come here and take a look um, to this uh, massive uh, piece of work. Um, in the last um, 20 minutes that we are given, if we want to have some space also for questions, if you, if you have for our speakers, we would like to zoom a bit out uh, from the AI Act and look more in general uh, to other pieces of European legislations which are legalizing and normalizing the use of uh, border technology. Um, and the reason why I would like to do this exercise is to show how pervasive uh, this normalization process is and that we should all be aware and be able to um, connect uh, the dots uh, between um, racist and oppressive migration um, policies and um, digital files. So to go back to the same um, uh, order as before. Um, I would like to ask uh, every one of our speakers what other um, EU legislative files we should uh, look at when uh, we want to monitor the rise of uh, border tech. And I would like to start with Simona since you have a quite broad overview of this intersection of migration and digital files. Thank you. Thanks. Well, yes, we've already heard that it's being 
facilitated and legitimized um, by the Commission, by the Member States, and we see this in funding, but now also in laws. And not only in one, because the AI Act already legitimizes a couple of very worrying uses, the emotion recognition, the lie detectors, the risk profiling in the context of migration. But um, it's spread across all different files, because one I'm very worried about is the Schengen Borders Code, where uh, in the revision, Article 13 now says that in the case of instrumentalization of migrants, those are situations like uh, where in Belarus, um, w when they were sending people over the border to Poland, they call that instrumentalization of migrants, which already I find quite a dehumanizing term. Um, now, uh, the Commission gives the Member States a huge discretion to send mobile units, drones, and uh, all kinds of sensors to the borders to reinforce the borders. And yes, as the previous panelists already said, obviously what they're doing there is to facilitate pushbacks. It's not to welcome them with uh, food, blankets, and a safe environment and health checks. It's to make sure they don't cross the border. And this is in law. They can, may use all technical means. So that's one I'm very worried about. And another worrying development, apart from the AI Act and the Schengen Borders Code, is that I see that these huge databases we've been speaking about, and there are really many, they're increasingly all being linked to each other. We see already in Europol that currently there's another interesting session about that um, they're basically using all these huge databases to be able to train AI on it in the future and use that in very dangerous ways, as we saw, for example, in the Child Benefits Affair. Um, and in the screening regulation that, for example, Tineke is shadow on, so I'm working on for the digital aspects, we also see these databases coming back constantly. And we initially voted against these databases in the first place because we think they're really dangerous and don't contain enough safeguards. But now we see in all the future legislation as well, all these databases are now an established fact and constantly coming back. And screening, for example, one of the first steps is check all the databases. And we're trying to push back and say, OK, but then it shouldn't have any new consequences. People shouldn't then suddenly be rejected while they're fictively non-entered -ent into the territory yet. Um, but it's really, I find that really worrying. What, a small what brings a small positive note of hope is that I see that especially since I think in 2021, in around July, there were huge reports about sound cannons at the border to push people back lie detectors, uh, but EU funded. And I think this did shock at least lawmakers in the European Parliament. From left and even at that time to right, we convinced them to, to, to come in with us and ask questions to the European Commission about this. How is it funded? And I think the more dystopian these technologies get, the less we see room to justify them. And for example, in the screening regulation, and it's really compared to all the disastrous developments, only a tiny step, but it, under negotiation now, we have included in the screening regulation at least a part where um, biometric recognition, biometric categorization, predictive analytics, lie detectors, and sound cannons will be prohibited in at least the screening facilities and reception areas. So this is a tiny first step of hope towards, uh, well, a different approach to these technologies. Thank you, Simona. And thank you for ending on a hopeful note, because clearly we need some, some of that. Um, and yeah, thank you for um, giving some of these examples, screening regulation, Schengen Borders Code, and also raising the, the issue of um, the Horizon 2020 funded projects and how they are the basis for um, legitimizing some of this uh, technology. I would like now to ask Niovi, what do you think are the other pieces of regulation or policy making that we should be looking at? Um, well, if there was a glimpse of hope, prepare to have it uh, <laughs> completely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, so you've been uh, hearing a lot about databases and uh, one thing to note is that there are six of them and they are going to be interconnected. The problem is that the three of them are currently developed and the other three are under development, including they are what's called interoperability. I'm not going to go through that. There is, I wrote 700 pages on this. I'm not going to discuss it now. But uh, because these uh, pieces of legislation are still not fully enforced because the databases are under development, we, are, we, we have things to wait for. So entry exit system, ETIAS, the equivalent of ESTA or of ETA for Canada and uh, Australia, uh, ECRIS TCN and interoperability means that the databases are going to be interconnected. But it's more than that. Essentially, what we've come to understand is that because we have the databases, interoperability allowed the use of artificial intelligence. When you have separate databases, you can't have inter um, interoperability in artificial intelligence being uh, in place. And then there is more. That's not it. The, piece of the legislation themselves doesn't say everything. So there is a huge amount of delegated and implementing acts, and by that I mean more than 50, which are currently negotiated without the involvement of the European Parliament because they are delegated and implementing acts. And many of them are not even published. So we can't have even access to see what is being discussed. Even with access of information requests, they are not giving us the um, access to even the proposals because for, for security reasons. And if that's not bad enough, we have new pieces of legislation because migration is only a part of a big puzzle. Mobility in itself is an inherently suspicious activity and it's not just migrants who are a problem, but the mobile person. So a new piece of legislation is uh, the European Passenger Information uh, Regulation. It's actually a proposal of two regulations, one for migration purposes and one for law enforcement. And in uh, the near future, there are going to be changes in the exchange of information for the Schengen Information System and something that I find it completely confusing, the exchange of border guards with information with their counterparts in third countries uh, at the border. So someone arrives and then the border guard will have the possibility to speak to the Libyan, the uh, Tunisian counterpart on exchange of information. I find it's completely scary, but uh, still we're waiting for that proposal. They're just consultation at the moment. So there is a lot of work to be done and uh, the fight never stops. Yes. <laughs> Hope destroyed, but um, yeah, uh, a lot of work to be done and 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 organization uh, to coordinate. Thank you. I was not aware of these last examples you gave, so the picture is getting like um, more and more um, preoccupying. So, Alina, what do you think are the things that we should look at on top of of the uh, elements that Niovi uh, talked about? Uh, well, my colleague Marta in PICOM has also been following the, the Schengen Border Code uh, revision and uh, shares the concerns um, that have already been expressed. And I think it's, it's interesting and maybe relevant to also just underscore that the Commission itself has acknowledged that the new measures increase the risk of racial profiling and discriminatory selection of persons being checked in border zones. So this is something, this, th this is something understood uh, by those who prepared the proposal, that um, that these risks exist of perpetuating further uh, discrimination. So the, the 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 other things that I was going to note are not maybe so much legislative files, but more kind of programs um, that that I know that others in this conference today are following closely in terms of how Europol, for example is also part of this whole picture on the processing of data for immigration control, linked to what we've heard about these mega databases on migration. Um, and so some of you may have heard about this PEDRA program, Processing of Personal Data for Risk Analysis. Again, this idea of risk coming back into this. Um, and the intention is that Frontex officers would gather information about migrants about those who are suspected of being involved in smuggling, trafficking, or terrorism. 
Um, and this data is shared and processed together with Europol. Um, and according to a report by, the, by Balkan Insight, um, Frontex has shared more than 11, the, the personal data of more than 11,000 people with Europol between 2016 and 2021. And my understanding is that since 2021, when the data we're speaking about includes uh, at least the possibility of connecting, uh, collecting genetic data and alongside biometric data, information about religious beliefs and sexual orientation. So, I mean, we're really talking about sweeping amounts of personal data that are collected in the context of this program. Um, and then maybe just another program that, um, that I myself had only just learned about that was operating in parallel, a Europol program called Secondary Security Checks, um, involving the use of facial recognition technology in camps in Greece and Italy that is extended to other countries, again with the purpose of identifying so-called suspected terrorists and criminals. So I think, again, we see this notion of, um, um, of identifying suspects of crimes being completely commingled with migrants and, and immigration in a way that is really justifying the use of incre increasingly invasive technologies. Um, so I think, and oftentimes very, very opaque in terms of the nature of these programs. Um, so yeah, I think those are some additional developments that um, Fortunately, there are, um, there, I guess for me, the, 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 the spark of hope is precisely that there are people here today who are following these issues, who are paying attention, and increasingly working together um, to really try to, to come up with ways to, uh, to, to respond, um, to react, to give visibility. There's increasingly attention to these issues by journalistic groups, um, by investigative journalism. So I think that is what gives me hope because so much of this is so hidden and is so easy to kind of just absorb as part of the status quo about how migration policy works. And we're starting, I think, to see more and more people realizing what's going on and really being concerned and being mobilized around trying to do something. So that is my spark of hope in this context, but there's a heck of a lot of work to do. Thank you, Lina, and thank you for closing with this uh, spark of hope, um, which, yeah, it's, it's clearly like um, collaborating, working together, it's clearly a necessity because as you are all proving right now, um, the uh, border uh, industrial complex is scattered all around. Uh, it's not only in the AI Act, but in, in many different um, places. So um, it's indeed a necessity to work together. And maybe destroying a bit of hope, but um, Hope, could you tell us what we should be looking at? Yeah, uh, so I was also going to mention the Schengen Borders Code reform. So obviously <laughs> we're all aware that that's a very important file. Um, but yeah, I think the, the instrumentalization regulation together with that and the articles about instrumentalization in the Schengen Borders Code speak specifically about increased usage of new technologies and about an increased role of Frontex who would have control over those new technologies. So this is a really important area to focus, but some tentative hope um, is that the draft report that came out, the articles around instrumentalization were removed. So we just have to hope that they stay removed in the following debates, but that's a small bit of hope. Um, and there's also in the Schengen Borders Code reform a lot about internal readmissions within states within Schengen, um, and those would rely heavily on um, racist policing and risk policing, which we wrote a paper about with ASCII, who have uh, documented at the Italian border people being profiled based on their race and then checked for their documents and then being internally referred, uh, returned, which is an illegal pushback to Slovenia, and then obviously we have cases of chain refoulement all the way from Italy to Slovenia to Croatia back to Bosnia. So, and all of this is facilitated by racist policing and new technologies, and that's all legislated for in the Schengen Borders Code reform, so we definitely have to keep an eye on if those things are brought back in uh, during the negotiations. 
Another very important area is, again, not necessarily a particular um, piece of legislation, but again, going back to databases, this is something that we are monitoring very closely with the new so-called bulk and DAC system. So uh, we've obviously seen since 2017 an increasing externalization into the Western Balkan region um, of the EU's migration problem. So trying to put people back in Serbia, in Bosnia, in Albania, and uh, giving these states uh, funding through the IPA, the instrument for pre-accession, and giving them all candidacy status for accession. And what we're now seeing is um, the promise that there will be databases made in these Western Balkan states, which people are calling the Balkan DAC, um, which will then be with a view to be interoperable and interconnected with Eurodac. But there's no uh, guarantee that that will be post-accession. So there's no guarantee that these databases will be regulated by EU legislation because they're taking place outside of EU member states. And the only people who technically have uh, access to these databases is Frontex. Frontex can access the national databases in the areas of operation and can access Eurodac. Obviously, we know the huge issues with Frontex, given the OLAF report um, that came out, that they are complicit in illegal pushbacks at the very least. So allowing Frontex to have access to these two different databases, which are not necessarily legislated for under EU law, is a blatant violation. So this area of databases and further externalization into the Western Balkans to set up this sort of hotspot approach whereby people can be fingerprinted in the Balkans, then found in member states, then returned to the Balkans. Then the Balkans become this hotspot region where we're outsourcing our migration management there. So that's something that's very important to keep an eye on, RE databases. Thanks. Not very hopeful, sorry. <laughs> Not very hopeful, but certainly important um, yeah, to raise also how uh, maybe migration policies try to reinforce the idea that um, we have borders, but at the same time, this kind of collaborations seems not to have borders um, since there is the expansion of uh, digital surveillance beyond the European um, geographical borders. So this is a really important um, uh, example that you gave. Thank you. So it seems that we were perfectly on time to save some, uh, some minutes for questions. Um, I'm sure you received a lot of information. Um, so I see that we have some hands raised already. One, two, and three. So I give you the microphone. Can I please ask you to mention whether your question is for one particular speaker or for all of them? Thank you very much, Ariel. Thank you very much for the very interesting panel. Sara Presciani from Aeromed Rights. Uh, it's uh, not to a specific um, person, but it's more related to the second question, which are the legislative file. Because uh, looking at the migration context, we see the external dimension, the externalization policy is the pillar now of the EU policy. Uh, so, and mainly related to border management. So we are providing all these um, tech tools, among them also artificial intelligence, one, to countries such as Egypt, Libya, Tunisia. You have been mentioning the collaboration with the Libyan and Tunisian Coast Guard, so I would like to have more information on in which policy framework is foreseen this kind of collaboration, but more generally, um, which kind of way to challenge the use of EU budget for providing this kind of uh, tools for border management to third country that violated human rights and their citizen rights and migrants and refugee rights. And I'm thinking on countries such as Turkey, Libya, Egypt, and the more generally, all the southern shore of the Mediterranean region. Thank you. Do you want to answer now, or do you want to take a couple more questions? Maybe collect all the questions yeah? and then okay. we could like one. Uh, can I see? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So my name is Halit Kayan. I'm a researcher at Kai Leuven uh, Center for in IP Law. I have one question and one comment, or nuance comment, or counter argument. So I'll start with the last one. Okay, I'll start. I'll, I'll only <laughs> ask the question. Uh, okay, so um, 
So Alina mentioned that uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights and, and European Convention on Human Rights apply to everyone, but EU currently tries to circumvent them by referring to criminal procedures or security. And Niovi mentioned that there's not much case law right now about all these, all these issues we are discussing right now. And uh, other speakers also mentioned similar things, like Simone mentioned on transparency and, and Hope mentioned pushbacks. And we are actually talking right now here about not... So when we talk, when we say pushbacks, we should, uh, we should accept the fact that we are, we are talking about killings. Not, not always, maybe, but also, also killings. And uh, some people may find my, my thoughts very bold, but... Uh, migration, the, the EU's approach to migration is kind of, in my opinion, the, the greatest failure of European values and, and European idea, um, European project. And uh, I wonder um, whether you, you are aware of any case law uh, to, be, to be produced soon or, or you think um, there will be some 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 change, I mean not change, but some some case law uh, showing that uh, such 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 practices or such an such an AI act will go against the human dignity, uh, the, the 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 right to life and and all other fundamental human rights. And also, I would like to ask everyone here. Uh, whether you are planning or currently doing any any work on uh, legislative procedures, for example, right now I, I I'm well aware of the fact that Access Now does much on this area, for example, or, or other NGOs or Edri. So do you do you plan to I don't know lodge a file or anything or or support anyone uh, suffering from these these kind of mistreatments? And uh, and yeah, I, I think I should I should uh, make it not any longer. Thank you. Thank you. And we had another question here. Hello. Um, this could be answered by anyone and everyone. Um, I really want to take it back to the the hope and practical applications of this because it's great to be here and be well informed. We want this to translate into kind of mobilization, grassroots mobilization. And I really wanted the panel to speak to that because uh, we've seen the Overton window shift even further right, and migration is often a proxy for, the, you know, it's a, it's a shorthand for center right, rightwards to the far right to kind of distract from economic discontent. And unfortunately, the times we're living in now, that's easily weaponized, as we see in across Europe, um, continental Europe, as well as in the UK. And so, unfortunately, you have people even who are, who are descendants of migrants themselves who will parrot these kind of far-right rhetoric or, or very migrant suspicious rhetoric. And so I'm trying to, and I don't have as much hope in the EU projects or the EU value system, because when you have senior EU officials talking about Europe being a garden that needs to keep out the jungle and the rest of the world, I, I, I don't think, I think that reflects really the true values more so than any other kind of um, uh, official rhetoric about, um, uh, about respecting um, um, rights across the board, regardless of origin. So I guess I'm just asking, what would you... <laughs> in terms of mobilizing the grassroots and getting people to, getting the public mood to shift, because this is where you can, this is where you have the resistance, this is where you have the backlash. And Alina gave an example of a small victory in Holland um, in terms of certain, a racist policy that was kind of shut down because of, you know, of the, of the um, resistance from the public. So, uh, and also just for us here, what can we do to kind of um, facilitate uh, some kind of uh, grassroots movement to make sure that these uh, dehumanizing policies um, don't see the light of day. Thanks. Thank you. And we've got five minutes left, so I'll uh, give it to the speakers whether you want to answer these questions maybe or take more. Yeah? Okay. I maybe can suggest that um, you all maybe take 
one minute to answer the questions and you decide uh, what I'm going to pick. But thank you everyone for these very interesting comments and questions. Um, does anyone want to start or should we follow the order? Simona, do you want to go first? Yeah, fine to go first and I'll try and keep it very brief. Uh, to answer the first speaker on the funding of these technologies, this is something we're also really very worried about and what we're doing now especially is case by case written questions um, on specific cases of bizarre border technologies we encounter. Also again, with thanks to civil society, uh, investigative journalists, uh, academics. So that also combines my answer with uh, the, the last uh, question. How can we keep up the good work, mobilize people, um, change the public opinion? I think is really bringing these cases to light because the more we know about these bizarre um, practices at the borders, around reception areas, during screening and asylum procedures, uh, the more the outrage about it is fueled, I think. And uh, on, well, on the funding, we're really trying to get ex-anti-fundamental rights conditionality in. Because now what happens is the answer to all our written questions are, well, we don't fund things in violation of fundamental rights, but it's up to the member state itself to look into fundamental rights violations by itself. Right. Doesn't sound very convincing. So for us, the thing we're really trying to push is ex-ante fundamental rights conditionality to EU funding, and especially in these innovation and border funds. And on the court cases, I wouldn't really know, but shameless promo, Tina Gestrick is a migration professor and has a... Uh, blog in which she shares all her legal views, so maybe there might be interesting stuff on there sometime soon. Thank you very much, Simona. Uh, Niovi, you have one minute. I know. Uh, on cases. Uh, one case on I border control program, on, not on the fundamental rights uh, problems, but on transparency uh, in respect of um, having documentation about impact assessments of an EU-funded research project. Patrick uh, should be here today. I saw him on the program. He's, he's litigating the case. And one case relating to machine learning, click the dry man on PNR. Uh, there it prohibits uh, self-learning systems which are unsupervised. But this is the only thing, and this case has already been criticized as unrealistic. Um, with regard to mobilization, uh, there are many ways. Uh, unfortunately, I believe that unless it becomes personal to European citizens, they will not get that much mobilized. That's why uh, I think that uh, uh, these technologies are only tested on migrants and if they become also applied on citizens. And then people are going to become more mobilized, unfortunately. In the meantime, strategic litigation, I wait for that email that there is an applicant that we can take it to court. And finally, uh, there is a fundamental rights agency e-learning tool being developed at the moment by myself and a colleague, uh, which will provide more um, awareness on people. And that's it, I think. Fantastic job. Uh, to see all of this in uh, a minute and 10 seconds. Alina, are you up for the challenge? So I'm so glad we were asked about what the role is of potential litigation. And I'm so glad we were asked about mobilization and grassroots. I mean, all of it, all of it has to happen. Um, I mean, I'm not an expert, but my sense is part of the challenge is, as we heard earlier, that as far as these interoperable systems, these are the, what we're dealing with, not only in terms of those, but in terms of many of these, this is EU level legislation that itself is in conflict with itself. So we have the GDPR, we have the law enforcement directive on the one hand, we have the Charter of Fundamental Rights, and then we have this other legislation that seems to actually just like forget that that exists. So it's about how do we also, the, the opportunities to actually challenge EU legislation. But I think at the national level in terms of implementation, not all of it's implemented yet, but we already see some work, um, Homo Digitalis, for example, challenging the Greek smart policing program before the DPA, the, the national level data protection uh, office. So I think there are opportunities to do more at the national level where we already see implementation happening in a widespread way. Mobilization, there are really important challenges because of how opaque a lot of this is, because how complicated a lot of it seems. But again, what we were saying earlier, I think we're starting to, it's really important to connect the dots, that this is not 
fundamentally technical, technological issue. This is a racial justice issue, a migrant rights issue, a democracy issue. So our existing movements need to find ways to speak to each other and to, to the grassroots um, as well. And actually tomorrow we have a session with PECOM's membership together with Euromed Rights to have that dialogue together about how this work at the EU level connects with their experience. Fantastic job, thanks. Hope. Okay, I will try to just really quickly say two things. <laughs> so first of all, in terms of the externalization and all the funding to third countries, um, to go an even higher level, to the international level, the UN is also now developing its focus on new technologies. They're creating a global digital compact this year. So that's the kind of instrument that maybe it's useful to look at those mechanisms at the international level. What can the EU be mandated through UN procedures? Um, they're even currently looking into the use of new technologies in enforced disappearances, so in pushbacks, essentially. So it's really important to look at what's developing on the UN level. Um, as well, and I will just jump to the last question quickly. Uh, so our all of our testimonies are public. We It's one of the largest open source databases in Europe, and lots of people have used this as a resource. So we've had people create theatre plays out of our testimonies, print them off, take them to government buildings, use them in protests. So obviously this huge book, uh, we don't have that many copies of, but the database itself is online and we create this open source evidence for people to use in different forms of mobilization. It's all public, so use it in all different forms of grassroots mobilization. It's all there for you to use. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks everyone, thank you speakers uh, for sharing your knowledge, your experiences, your expertise. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, it was a great discussion. Um, yeah.